Okay, everybody, I think we're ready to start. Thank you so much for your patience, and more importantly, thank you for being here today. Can you guys hear me in the back? Is this working? Not very well? I'll try to get closer. All right, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the full room. Um, and I'm thrilled about the topic we're addressing today. My name is Kara Horowitz. I'm the co-executive director of our Emmett Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at UCLA Law. Uh, which was founded as the first law school center in the country aimed at finding law and policy solutions to climate change. I want to acknowledge first two incredible donors who sit with us in the audience. I'm sure they'll be embarrassed that I'm doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Dan Emmett and Shirley Shapiro are both with us here today. And without their generosity through the years, we wouldn't be here, so I just want to take a moment and thank them. I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this event. They are the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, the Luskin Center for Innovation, Sustainable LA uh, Grand Challenge at UCLA, and Climate Resolve, and Climate Resolve's Executive Director Jonathan Parfrey is also here somewhere. Thank you guys all. Um, I want to note that it's been 10 years since the Emmett Institute was founded. In that time, we've grown tremendously. We've had the opportunity to work at every level of government, from the hyper-local to the international. But one of the cornerstones of our work from the very beginning, and frankly, a strategic advantage for us as an institute, has been our ability to work um, on state-level policy here in California one of the world's environmental law pioneers. Arguably, no jurisdiction in the world has done more to innovate on environmental policy than California. And there are many examples of this. I'll just name a few. It essentially invented modern air pollution regulation. It was so far ahead of its time on this topic um, that it won a special carve out in the Clean Air Act to keep on innovating in this space, whereas other states have to yield to the federal jurisdiction on that issue. Um, its Coastal Commission has played a really signature role in keeping California's coastline open to public access and keeping our iconic coast recognizable despite immense development pressures through the years. Um, and on climate change, it is such a globally recognized force that it has de facto earned a seat at the table of UN climate negotiators, whereas that's normally reserved just for countries. Um, this is a moment of transition in California. Former Governor Brown served for a total of four terms in Sacramento, and those terms coincided with California's emergence as an environmental law pioneer. Our new governor has now arrived, Governor Newsom, to a pretty significant to-do list that includes issues such as water management for the long term, fire management in an increasingly uh, risky environment, transit, fossil fuel supply, and housing, just to name a few of the items that I imagine are at the top of his mind when he thinks about environmental policy. So it seemed to us to be a good time to take stock of California as an environmental leader, where it's been and where it's going. Um, the idea for this symposium is to answer questions uh, like the following, or at least to ask them and to begin to have conversations about them. What has really driven California's history of environmental law leadership over the years? Where did it succeed best under Governor Brown and why? And what rem work remains to be done under Gavin uh, Newsom and going forward? Uh, what will its environmental innovation look like in the future? So uh, that's our topic for today. With that set up, I'm really pleased to introduce and welcome our keynote speaker for the day, Mary Nichols, even though I know for this audience and for many others, she needs no introduction. Uh, Mary Nichols is the chair of the California Air Resources Board. She served as board chair under three governors, starting uh, way back with Governor Brown during one of his first terms in the 70s. Um, she has also served as California Secretary for Natural Resources, as a senior staff attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council, as assistant administrator for EPA's Office of Air and Regulation under President Clinton, and among other things, as the head of our own UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, so we do claim her happily. Um, her career as an environmental lawyer has spanned over 45 years and she's played a really key role in California and in the nation in um, working for progress on air quality in particular. She's also led the Air Resources Board in crafting California's internationally recognized climate action plan. Um, her awards and accolades are uh, so numerous and so impressive, I'm not even going to bother to name them. Instead, what I'm going to do is just share some of her most fun 
and impressive monikers, mostly um, uh, named by the press. She has been called, among other things, the Queen of Green, the Thomas Edison of environmentalism. I think that one refers to California and states generally as laboratories of democracy. Um, she's been called California's environmental rock star, America's top climate cop, and not to limit things too provincially to just America, she's also been called one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, she has a really unique perspective on the development and importance of California's environmental law leadership, and in many ways she has been that leadership for decades. So we thought it would be appropriate to kick off today's event by hearing from her and asking her to give her perspective on this role. Um, she'll give remarks for you know, 10, 15 minutes, and then I'm going to jump in and ask her a few more questions. Please join me in welcoming Mary. Is this on? Can you hear me? Great. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, it's an awesome audience here today, and I can't get away with much of anything because uh, there are so many people here who played a key role in uh, one or another, if not all, of the things that I'm going to describe. But I am going to uh, attempt to give a personal perspective, and um, at the risk of being corrected later by people who know more, um, talk about what I think is likely to happen in the next few years uh, in California's role as a state innovator. So uh, first of all, I have to say that um, this morning's uh, trip out to UCLA kind of illustrated for me in some ways how things have changed and, uh, and in some ways how they have not changed. So it used to be when you were late for an event in anywhere in LA, you could blame traffic. That is no longer possible because unless you've been living in a cave, you know traffic is going to delay you, right? And you just better start earlier. So you can't really do that. But now we can talk about parking and the fact that it's really difficult to find a place to park. Parking was never easy here at UCLA, but it's now quite a bit harder. Um, and I also faced my first true ethical dilemma of the day, I think anyway, uh, when I pulled into the parking lot having gotten my pass, um, which wasn't that easy to wrangle out of the woman in the kiosk, but she finally acknowledged that, that I had one, um, <laughs> which was, there was no parking except there was this lovely row of charging slots, places you could pull in and charge your electric car. And I had to think, okay, I'm driving an electric car. It is a plug-in vehicle. On the other hand, I just charged before I left this morning. I don't need to charge. I'm not going to charge. So am I going to be taking away a space from somebody who might actually need the charging by parking here? And I will confess that I resolved that in favor of taking the parking spot, <laughs> partly because I was running late but also because I saw that there were at least six other slots there. So if, unless there's really a big rush of cars needing to charge all at once, um, I'm going to be okay. Um, but I think that's a wonderful problem to have. And I especially am proud of UCLA for having dedicated so many spaces to people who are going to be doing electric charging because that's a key ingredient, um, not only of making it possible for people to drive electric, uh, but also of showing others that, um, hey, it's not a bad idea to get an electric car because you could get a parking spot that way, at least for a while. So hopefully this will uh, be a success and there will be more competition for those spaces the next time, uh, uh, the next time I come here. Um, I also uh, wanted to start out this morning um, by uh, giving a testimonial to a person who um, very sadly died last night and who happened to share a last name with me, although we are not related to each other. And that was a man by the name of Ron Nichols, who has been uh, in charge of uh, the Southern California Edison's program to promote electric trans uh, transportation now for the last several years. And um, he uh, was a partner for me in a number of different ventures, um, most recently including a 
completely new institution that we have created called VELOS, which is a consortium of public and private entities who are uh, working under a, a banner of a new uh, nonprofit organization to uh, overcome barriers to electric transfer. And Ron was um, one of the first to see that vision, to put his company behind it, uh, to make Southern California Edison, at least within this state, clearly the uh, leading utility um, actor on uh, all forms of electrification, not just for putting in charging stations in homes and public places, but looking at all of our major commercial facilities and at the roadways that already exist and in particular for um, grabbing the vision of electric transportation as something which could be uh, not only a good thing for the environment, but also a force for, uh, for equity. And uh, I will talk about that a little bit more in a second. But um, I'm here because I've had the great good fortune to come to California and to be part of uh, what happened in California, the story of what happened in California when we really seriously began to tackle smog and then later to build on that to begin to try to play a role in uh, the world of global, uh, global air pollution known as climate change, which is obviously an order of magnitude more <laughs> widespread and in many ways more uh, catastrophic in its implications, but which builds uh, totally on uh, some of the same insights that caused us to um, be able to identify the, the causes and, and to take some uh, quite serious and important actions to, to clean up smog in urban areas. So um, you have a, a great agenda here today, and uh, and I think the topics are all the right topics. And I'm not going to try to foreshadow what what the uh, answers to all the questions are that are that are going to be raised. Um, but I, I do want to just give you a bit of a perspective because um, you know as I come towards the sunset of my time uh, at ARB, which will inevitably happen, um, I uh, have the opportunity to, to do some looking back. And when you're in this situation, people always say to you, you should write a book. So I've been thinking about writing a book. I would call it My Three Presidents or something like that. Uh, my Three Governors, uh, really. My Three Governors and One President. Um, but, you know, uh, what's unique about California, what has enabled us to do what we've been able to do, is an unusual combination of things that are unique to California and things that are definitely not unique to California and that anybody could do. And indeed, one of the most gratifying things that's happening to me right now is seeing and having some opportunities to interact with uh, governors of other states, uh, many of them just newly elected, who have decided to take on uh, climate pollution or uh, air pollution or um, electric transportation or advanced vehicles and to um, make them signatures of their own. Uh, because governors, wherever they are, whatever their state is, uh, large or small and wherever it's located geographically, uh, are uh, in a unique position to be the CEOs of these uh, laboratories of democracy that uh, that the Supreme Court referred to, and uh, which I think is absolutely correct. California's unique position is that we are bigger than everybody else. Uh, we have this amazing coastline and uh, a, a pattern of um, geography as well as uh, climate, which is uh, one of our assets, which is something that draws people here. If they don't come here in spite of it and brave the winters, although um, I guess if you're earthquake averse, you might have to take that into account. But mostly people come here because they love the weather and they want to be outdoors and they want to be in a beautiful place. Um, and that's that remains true and it remains one of those things that is kind of a touchstone that you can get people to um, respond to if you're talking to them about what it might take to preserve that kind of an environment. So politically, the environment has been salient here at times and in ways that it has not been in most other places. Um, you could point to Florida uh, in certain times. You can point to other states where 
hunting or access to um, you know to uh, uh, to particular uh, ecosystems has been really important to people. But but we have it all here with the mountains and the coastline and. Uh, you know all the all the opportunities that are uh, out there for recreation and for development of people. And so when you meet people um, who grew up here, whether they come from north or south, inner city or uh, otherwise, they have some memories of uh, having been taken into the out of doors as kids and interacted with them with their families. And that is important. Jerry Brown had the advantage of coming into office at a time when it was pretty clear that um, there was a, a one of those demographic revolutions going on in which there was a generational shift happening. He was part of the generational shift. He brought into office a bunch of people who were part of the generational shift. I was 29 years old when I was first appointed to the Air Resources Board. I was one of Jerry's first appointees. Obviously, I stuck up stuck with it for a long time, and that gave me some um, advantages as well in terms of being able to look back. But mostly what I remember about the early stages of uh, Jerry's administration was that the place was full of younger people who were mostly considered by uh, the people that they were replacing and many of the legislators as being too young and too inexperienced for doing what they were doing. And he appointed them because uh, he wanted to make change happen. He was impatient with what his father had done or not done to make change. And the environment was one of those key issues where he saw that the public was ready for more action and that um, he could, as a governor, make some things happen that people hadn't dared to do before. So the idea of taking on uh, major uh, corporate employers or of challenging the auto industry at its core in terms of the products that they were making and selling in California, the idea that we could reshape the future of what our electricity system was going to be like. These were ideas that were not like did not require a huge amount of uh, in-depth consideration uh, for him to say, we want to do something here and to push for action to be taken. Um, and so uh, so we did. And you know, I can uh, many of my memories of Jerry Brown in the early stages are of getting calls from him often at not very appealing hours of the night <laughs> saying, you know, why aren't you doing more about this or why aren't people more upset? Upset than they seem to be about smog. You know, if they were really upset about it, wouldn't they be supporting the diamond lanes or whatever? Um, second big insight in all of this, and I think you'll, I'm sure you'll talk more about this later, is that um, one of the things that Jerry realized pretty quickly, like within months of being in office, when he had to sign a piece of urgency legislation repealing a law which I had helped to um, get passed and had sued the state because they weren't implementing it. That law was a requirement that people who owned older cars would take them in and get them retrofitted with a device that was designed to reduce emissions of nitrogen oxides. In the early days of controlling smog, the state went along with the auto industry and others who were convinced that it would be much cheaper and easier to control smog by attacking the other main ingredient of smog, which is um, volatile organic compounds, as we often call them, or hydrocarbons. Smog being a mixture of hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides that are produced by combustion. It's, uh, there's a lot more hydrocarbons around. They're easier to find ways to control. Therefore, we should work on that and let the NOx go because anything that involves either changing or reducing the amount of combustion inevitably leads you into questions like, are you going to drive less or are you going to um, use less, uh, less fuel and so forth? So the state had embarked on this program, which mostly involved controlling VOCs. And not only was this not 
successful, but it also pushed the smog out to the east because the emissions that cook in the sunlight also move with the wind over the course of a day. And so what was helping on the west side of Los Angeles, at least to some degree, was making things visibly worse in the Inland Empire. So if you were living in Riverside or San Bernardino in those days, you were, you were at the bottom of the funnel and you were getting bad air from Los Angeles. My entry, entry into this scene came when I moved to Los Angeles in 1971, right out of law school, was able to land a job with another story with a public interest law firm that was just getting started and became their air pollution lawyer because nobody else wanted to do it and there wasn't any air pollution law in those days. Uh, but the Clean Air Act had just been passed and so I thought maybe there was an opportunity to do something. The city of Riverside came to us and said, please uh, sue Los Angeles and make them stop sending us their smog. And um, it didn't take me long to realize that that was not likely to be a successful strategy. But uh, what I did convince them was that they could sue the federal government and the state of California to force them to develop a plan that would um, show how the state was going to achieve the uh, clean air standards that were in the new, the new federal Clean Air Act. So, um, that was that was the beginning of that, but um, the the law that involved requiring requiring the NOx retrofit devices was due to actually come into effect in 1975 at a time when the Arab oil embargo, which some of you may remember, was then. Um, uh, beginning to cause people to line up at gas stations and to be really worried about gas mileage, which is one of those things that only happens in rare occasions and doesn't last very long usually. But in this instance, it was at its height. People were in a panic about um, having to uh, pay more or being unable to get gasoline to drive. And uh, these Knox devices, which the state was now committed to pushing, um, had a fuel penalty associated with them. So the state was going to make you go in, buy one of these devices, which you know cost $100 or less, but it was that's a significant amount of money. And they were also going to screw up your ability to drive by making it harder for you to get gasoline. This was um, a, a, one of those events in which the legislature finds it possible to pass a bill within a matter of weeks, and they did. Uh, it landed on the governor's desk after the assembly member from Riverside, who had been the leading proponent of this uh, Knox retrofit program, um, uh, took the lead in trying to get the bill uh, repealed. And so I found one of my signature uh, projects already on the cutting room floor when I hadn't even been on the job for more than a couple of months. Um, so this is a, actually in some ways a pretty good um, story to illustrate what life is like when you're actually trying to make things happen in the trenches uh, with environmental law and environmental politics in the sense that technologies have uh, costs sometimes. And Jerry Brown's great insight, which um, took him a while to learn, actually, is that it doesn't make sense in a democracy to piss off too many of the people at any given time. And um, if you followed what's been happening in Paris with the yellow jackets, uh, the yellow vest movement, you can see what I mean illustrated in today's world, that um, we can sit here and we can articulate great strategies that make economic sense and make make policy sense, uh, but if we uh, fail in the implementation of them because we piss off too many people at one time and it happens at a moment when other things are uh, more important in their minds than uh, our particular issue, uh, we are not going to succeed. So um, that insight has been the guiding force now for many in politics, I would say, in California over a period of more than 40 years, where we set big aspirational goals and we turn it over to a bunch of unelected bureaucrats like me to figure out how to get to those goals and then hold them accountable for doing it or 
or not doing it. But either way, um, we give ourselves some flexibility in how we actually achieve the implementation. Um, that, I think, is a, a message that has not been lost on our current governor, who, of course, like any new governor, um, has a lot of things on his plate. He's got a big agenda. Um, veering in the direction of dealing with the parts of the air pollution and climate problem, which are also um, in and of themselves big problems for this state, including the um, divide between rich and poor and between the coastal and the inland parts of our state. He has made it very clear that he intends to take action to bring up the levels of uh, income and quality of life for people living away from the coastal areas. This also coincides with a sense of uh, need to deal with other inequities in our state as well. Um, but they really manifest themselves in the areas of housing and transportation and land use, which are the toughest things to deal with um, from the state perspective, because so much of the authority resides in local governments. And as we've seen this year, they will fight ferociously, and they are much closer in general to the people and to the neighborhoods, and so they have uh, superior ability in many cases to fend off anything that looks like a state policy grab where the state is going to come in and tell people how they can actually make decisions on what to build and, and where to build it. Um, Governor Newsom has recognized this issue and is proceeding carefully and cautiously. But I can tell you that as an employee of uh, this administration, I am seeing every day evidence that he wants to see the agencies that represent those topic areas working together, that we can no longer go along in sort of parallel fashion where we spend a lot of money on transportation in one place, we spend a lot of money on trying to turn over the fleet to get more uh, zero emission vehicles in another place, although it's only a fraction of what we spend on building roads. We can throw a bunch of money at the housing problem and we can tell everybody to go out and do more and do better, but it's gonna take Take a much more concerted and serious effort to forge policies that get the advocates for these individual issues actually working together and crafting solutions that will be a net benefit for all of them. So my prediction is that um, you're going to see, first of all, frustration because you know the legislation to change the world doesn't pass in the first six months or probably even the first year uh, of his administration. There might be some legislation, but it's not going to be the comprehensive solution to the homelessness problem, uh, very likely. That's, um, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I think I'm right about that. But I think within the next couple of years, you are going to see some very major changes in the way the state, at least, thinks about and delivers services in these areas and and spends money in these areas that will make a difference. So um, I'm going to stop at that point because I believe I'm supposed to be in a conversation with the director of the Emmett Center here and um, just say, uh, you know, I, there may be some people in this room who are like new to this issue, but if you are, I don't recognize you. Pretty much everybody here has a lot to say about these topics, so I hope they'll get a chance to do it over the course of the day, and I'm really looking forward to getting some new ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. If you wanted to go on for 10 more minutes, I'm happy to. <laughs> but I'm also happy to ask you some questions. OK. Um, that's what law faculty, part of what law faculty do best. Right. OK, so I'm thrilled to have you here. You started talking a little bit already about differences between the Governor Brown administration and Governor Newsom administration. Um, and I'd be curious to hear you expand on that topic a little bit further. Um, 
Do you see differences in substance or style or both in Governor Newsom's approach to air quality control and climate change in particular? And what should we expect in those two areas going forward under the Newsom administration as best you can tell so far? Well, first of all, let me tell you what I think has not changed. Um, in the first uh, weeks, I think, after uh, Gavin Newsom was elected governor, I started getting questions from people that I've been working with abroad in various different institutions, uh, governments and uh, nonprofits that work at the international level, wanting to know if Governor Newsom was going to be as committed to those kinds of activities as Governor Brown had been. And I honestly didn't know the answer to that question. Uh, but since that time, I have seen evidence that uh, he's going to double down, if anything, mm -hmm. on uh, Jerry Brown's activities in a somewhat different way, maybe. Um, we've already talked about where he should go if he's going to leave California to participate in international dialogue activities. Where's the place to go that makes the most sense? You know, you can't go everywhere for sure. And um, he did something that I thought was incredibly generous, mm -hmm. but also well based in his own history as a former lieutenant governor, which is that he designated our current new lieutenant governor, Eleni Kunalakis, uh, to be his lead person in a new um, uh, working group on international issues, which is actually designed to do two things. And I think this is a, also a, a useful insight into the way uh, Governor Newsom thinks about things, which is that um, she uh, has, as part of her mandate, coordinating the work of all the agencies that operate at a global level and looking at the two major reasons why we engage internationally, which are our interest in dealing with global climate change and our desire to promote trade and investment in California. So those two issues are not in conflict with each other. And in fact, in many instances, they work extremely well together because one of the things we have to offer is ideas and technologies that will help other parts of the world develop in ways that um, don't replicate all the mistakes that we made and help them you know, deal with very now uh, serious issues of air pollution in places like China and India. Uh, and also that we are engaged, but much less visibly, and I think in some ways maybe more effectively, in promoting California as a destination and as a place to invest than we were before. So few of you probably remember that Governor Davis actually shut down a whole network of um, trade offices that California used to maintain around the world, where we had state employees out there um, promoting California. We don't have any of that anymore. We don't even have a Department of Commerce anymore. Uh, and some of that was taken up by local entities and groups like the Port of Los Angeles, which are promoting their own um, businesses. And some of that has been done by the agencies themselves. And some of it hasn't been done because, you know, we're California. We don't have to go out there and sell ourselves because <laughs> everybody knows how wonderful we are. But um, the fact is that there is work that needs to be done. And so we're starting to be a lot more strategic about how we do it. And this new um, council is going to help coordinate some of that. So when we get these requests, which we now get over 100 of a year at ARB from international groups that want to come and visit us and sort of learn how we do things, um, we're going to have a better, uh, more um, multifaceted um, a, a list of things for them to do. And uh, you know, we're going we're to be a little bit more strategic about how we handle that. So, I'm saying the, what I guess is a better short answer to your question is, I think that Governor Newsom is going to build on what Governor Brown did, but torque it perhaps more in the direction of a holistic approach to um, California's investment and trade strategies as well. So let's talk more about climate change in particular, because California has an incredibly ambitious climate change mandate to reduce its statewide greenhouse gas emissions by about 40 percent between 2020 and 2030. Um, that's a lot to do in 10 years. I'm curious what your perspective is on the biggest challenges California has in meeting that goal and how we should overcome them. Well, first of all, I would say that 2030 is a milestone on the way to 2045. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to look at it in that context because we have a, an established goal of achieving zero net 
carbon or carbon neutrality, depending on uh, how you look at it. Neither of those is a very attractive term, but the concept is that we would not be making, as a state, a contribution to the global problem because we would be cleaning up as much uh, greenhouse gas as we emit. We can't probably get to zero emission without destroying our, our life as we know it in California, but we can capture carbon, we can store carbon, we can transform it to other things, we can take methane and find ways to eliminate the need for it to ever go into the atmosphere. It's a multifaceted kind of uh, program. 2030 is in some ways more difficult because some of the things that would take us to, to the net zero um, are longer term. And so we're gonna have to start on them now, but we won't get there probably, uh, by, or even, you know, we'll have made progress, but we will, certainly won't necessarily be completely obvious uh, how we get to 2045. Uh, but the answer to the 2045 dilemma is, I think, already in, in place, which is we will do more of what we're already doing, which is we will ratchet down on the low carbon fuel standard. We will ratchet down on um, emissions from motor vehicles and ta start to tackle the, the heavy duty vehicles that haven't been worked on yet. And we'll start doing more, I think, and, and, and being more effective in looking at how we invest in our infrastructure as a state, um, including housing to build a, a place that will be more resilient uh, for the future. That was a good plug for our panel three, by the way. <laughs> um, so let's talk about now um, more traditional air quality challenges. And I'm thinking in particular about the very public fight that California is having right now with the Trump administration over the um, what we call the California waiver, which is California's authority to create more ambitious, aggressive um, tailpipe standards for cars than the feds do and the Trump administration's proposal to revoke that waiver. I know if that happens, California faces a real set of challenges about how it meets its Clean Air Act goals. And I'm curious what California is thinking about strategically, creatively, about how to meet its Clean Air Act mandates in a world without the waiver. Well, uh, we have thought about this, uh, although we don't uh, care to spend a lot of time uh, thinking about it because of the simple reason that we don't think the waiver is actually going to go away. Um, I am not convinced that when it comes down to the very end of it that the federal government will try to revoke it, although there certainly are people there who would love to do it. And in their heart of hearts, I think the auto manufacturers would like to see it go away, but um, they have now themselves become convinced that um, the fight will hurt them more than it will help them, that the uncertainty, if nothing else, uh, just of the years of litigation that we will engage in is not really going to be helpful to them uh, in terms of where they want to go, especially since they rely on us now to create uh, incentives and to do so much in partnership with them to help promote the kind of vehicles that they all know um, they need to be making. I don't know if any of you saw in the uh, basketball game last night there was a, a Volkswagen ad uh, which got itself a whole article from Ad Age. Uh, Volkswagen is now publicly acknowledging the diesel uh, scandal and referring to it as the thing that was, you know, the worst thing that ever happened to them, but it caused them to make the change which is now going to turn them into the leading maker of zero emission vehicles in the world. So they've decided with a new ad agency to tell their story in a sort of a different way, but the, the story is, you know, we're the company that made the Beetle and made the, made the bus and we're going to be putting you in the electric car of your dreams and it's going to be great and we are the right people to do it because we went through this horrible experience and learned the error of what we were doing before. And, thank you, uh, ARB. <laughs> thank you, ARB, right. I, I personally feel proud of uh, having helped them along the way. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's great if that's the lesson that they learn from their experience. But the point here is just to say that um, what the Trump administration is doing is so contrary to the movement of history 
in the world that I don't think they will succeed, although how exactly they won't succeed remains to be seen. But in the meantime, we are certainly looking at the arsenal of um, things that we could use to keep dirty cars off of our roads and talking to other states that are interested in doing the same thing and building a larger movement than just the northeast states that we've always had in our camp that followed California standards. You know, we now have Colorado, we have several other states, including states that actually um, are, you know, in the Midwest and build cars looking at the California standards. So I feel like um, we will be able to build the backfire here, but. Um, it's not going to be. It's not going to be fun. That's for sure. Well, maybe it will be fun, but it's not. It's not, it's not fun something for I was some looking lawyers, for at this I time. Right. <laughs> okay, I think maybe there's time for um, one last question, and it's not about California at all. But I saw on your Twitter feed, which is fantastic, by the way, if you don't follow Mary on Twitter, you should. Um, that you recently met Greta Thunberg, the um, Nobel Peace Peace Prize. Um, Nominated. Nominee, thank you, not yet recipient, and 16-year-old yeah. um, climate activist from Europe who, among other things, has inspired the, the climate strike movement. And I'm curious what it was like to meet her, and more generally, what you're thinking these days about youth movements on climate change. Well, um, it was awesome. Uh, you know, she's, uh, first of all, she's very tiny. I'm not exactly <laughs> tall, but she, you know, comes up to my shoulder, and, and she's very, very serious. Um, she was traveling, we, we met in Vienna at a global climate conference where she was one of the featured speakers and um, I think maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger came close because he's a local hero, but I'm pretty sure she got by far the biggest ovation of anybody there and everybody else referred to her um, in some way or another. And at first I thought this was a little bit patronizing, you know, and it's not, it, it's easy to see how politicians would want to co-opt someone like that who has that kind of charisma. Um, but she is probably not co-optable from what I can see. Um, first of all, she's very serious um, and she's very thoughtful. She doesn't joke or banter, she does, uh, she, you know, she's, she is a teenager. She travels with a handler, a woman from the Swedish uh, Green Party who carries her water bottle and, <laughs> you know, tries to get her to eat lunch. And that seems to be, kind of, she's really a publicist, but, you know, Greta does not need a publicist from what I can see. She, she knows what she's doing and she's thought about it a lot. Um, so I met with her on the afternoon of the day that I arrived, and then the next day was the, the actual um, event. So um, I sat, after we chatted briefly, you know, Schwarzenegger shows up, and so we all sit down and talk for a while about the issues and about what's going on in California. She listened, didn't ask any questions really, uh, mostly just sort of nodded. Uh, although certainly her, her English is perfect, so I don't think it was a language issue. Um, but she was thinking about it and sort of taking it in. And she said, I'm going to go back and do some more work on my speech. And she's given a lot of speeches, you know, and I suspect that most of her speech is, you know, pretty much the same wherever it is. But um, this time it was clear she was uh, speaking directly to the world leaders who were there. And, you know, I'm talking about the Secretary General of the UN and, you know, um, the heads of state of a number of countries and a lot of environment ministers and business people and so forth. And she basically looked at them and said, you are not doing what you should be doing and here's what's wrong with it. That's the first thing. It's just that, you know, she has the ability to do that and to do it so directly, um, which is, you know, it's, it's fabulous. But, but what I found in some ways even more interesting is that her message isn't just you screwed up the planet and need to fix it, although that is certainly, you know, that's the, the, the main thrust of it. It's also saying you are not telling the people the truth about what's going on because you're all here acting like you've got the solutions and you've got this under control 
and you know just trust us or reelect us or whatever and we will fix the problem for us and you're not telling people how bad it really is you're not giving them the information that they need to make the decisions themselves about how they want to change their lives or change their society uh, you're not talking about the science and what it really shows and that's that's kind of the first line of what she is saying that we all need to be doing. I found that, uh, you know, pierced me to, to the heart, and I think it did to a lot of other people as well if they were listening, which is to say, you know, it's about communications, but communications, you know, not just in the Volkswagen ad way, but communications in terms of really addressing what, what the issue is. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think events like this, if I could say so, are, are so important if we use them to um, actually assess, you know, it's not just, I'm doing a lot of stuff that I think is good and that will move us in the right direction for sure, but am I really doing everything that I could be doing? Am I telling everybody what I should be telling them? No, of course not. And so, you know, we all need to be inspired to, to do more and do better. And there's nothing like having a generational shift, which is how I started my comments earlier to, to make you think about that. That's terrific. Okay, Thank I you. think we're going to have to leave it okay. there for now. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Mary. Thank you. Thank you.